Thank you. And uh, thank you to the organizers. This is a really important topic in my mind. It's something that I've thought about for many, many years. And uh, so I'm going to go quickly through some images. The word landscape appears in the English language for the first time at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century. And what's interesting about the concept of landscape at that time is it's about how we represent the landscape to ourselves. And the idea of landscape is led by artists, by poets, by people who are trying to understand what is this environment that we inhabit. And so in fact, the word landscape is first used to denote a painting of land, of scenery. And at the same time, the, another genre of painting appeared, which was called seascapes, which was representing the, the sea. This is uh, Claude Lorraine, a French landscape painter, but famous for his Italian landscape paintings. And remember, this is very early in the idea of landscape painting. This is in the early 17th century. So influential that in some ways the uh, picturesque, the sort of romantic idea of the English landscape derives in part from the appearance of Claude Lorraine and others paintings in England in the 17th and 18th century. This is an example of a seascape in the north. Uh, in Holland was very much a center of this idea. In fact, landscape, the first form of the word, uh, came from a, a Dutch thing. This is 1608, the cunning painter limbing a landscape various rich and rare. Uh, 1704, a little bit later, let us compare the natural face of the country with the landscapes that the poets have given of us. So I think it's very important to understand that landscape in its origins is about how we represent our environment to ourselves. A thousand years earlier, the Chinese had already begun to do this. And one of the things I love about this artist, um, Guo Xi, who is, uh, was it, he said at one point, a good landscape is one that is beautiful to look at. A better landscape is one that's beautiful to travel through, and the best landscape is one that's beautiful to dwell in. And I think that sense of engaging with the landscape, ultimately to dwell in the landscape, is very important and something, in some ways, that we've lost track of. We're, we're sort of stuck on that first one, something that's beautiful to look at. Another very ancient tradition, of course, is the Aborigine tradition in Australia, the idea of um, the song lines and understanding that, and some. This is a more recent representation of the song lines. But even in Canada, the Kashwenta, the Turo Wampum is in a sense a landscape painting. This is the two canoes traveling in parallel down the river to represent the two cultures of the treaty, respecting each other and moving together. And Greg Hill, who's now the curator of Aboriginal Art at the National Gallery, wrote a really brilliant thesis about this belt in which he explores what happens when you live in a culture without perspective, without three-point perspective. And he said, if I'm going to really pursue the idea of cultural heritage, what I would like to do is live in a world without three-point perspective or the European idea of perspective. And one of the points he makes is if you have perspective, eventually the, the canoes collide and you have assimilation <laughs> at the end of the route. There's a major shift that happens in the 19th century with the idea of landscape. And that is that instead of how does how do we represent the landscape to ourselves? The question becomes, how does the landscape represent us? That's a very anthropocentric view of landscape. How does the landscape serve as a mirror of our great accomplishments as humans? And it's really cultural geographers who create this whole discipline of cultural geography. And this idea of looking at the landscape as evidence of cultural patterns that have been imprinted on it, whether urban, rural, whatever, and what are the natural forces. And Carl Sauer in 1926, this very famous quote, which is still, in some ways, underlies every discussion on cultural landscapes of this day, culture is the agent, nature is the medium, the cultural landscape is the result. Another very famous person in this whole, uh, looking at how the landscape reflects us, is J.B. Jackson, the great landscape analyst and writer who founded the magazine Landscape in 1951. And many people say that his editorials in that are as good a kind of exploration of the North American landscape as anything that's ever been written. And this is just a quote that was in the very first editorial in the very first issue of Landscape in 1951. And I like this thing at the end. It's a rich and beautiful book, always open before us. We have but to learn to read it. And that's what he's helping doing. 
One of the things about cultural geography is it's very involved in mapping the landscape. And the whole idea of mapping, how do we map? And this sort of arrival of the Europeans in the North American landscape and starting to map it. What is, I think, very telling about that mapping is you see, this is Queenston where Willowbank is. You see, in fact, an, a mapping of the Aboriginal landscape with the waterways and the topography overlaid on it the European grid. And that clash of the natural landscape with the gridded landscape, in fact, is a really significant issue of how the landscape reflects who we are and who we are culturally. So then you get to the question of landscape as cultural heritage. And the question I guess I would ask is, when we deal with landscape as cultural heritage, are we following the tradition of the artists and the poets, or are we following the traditions of the cultural geographers? The Lake District was brought to UNESCO for the World Heritage List. Uh, it was too big to be a historic garden, which they knew how to deal with, or a historic city, how they, they knew how to deal with. And so the culture side, Ikemos, said to UNESCO, this isn't, we can't deal with this, this is too big for us. IUCN, which advises UNESCO on the natural side, said, this is not really a significant, this doesn't fit in our categories of a wilderness area, a national park or monument, or a habitat for uh, endangered species. So, no, it doesn't really help us. So, Ikemos in 1992 developed what they called Design, Evolved, and Associated Cultural Landscapes. U.S. Park Service uses somewhat similar words, Design, Vernacular, which is really the evolved, Ethnographic, which is the Associated, and also Historic Sites. And the Cultural Landscape Foundation uses exactly the same categories as U.S. Park Service. What's interesting between these is that Ikemos most of the sites have been designated or evolved cultural landscapes because they had historic districts which allowed them to deal with cities. This category allowed them to deal with rural areas. U.S. Park Service is also heavily involved with vernacular landscapes. The Cultural Landscape Foundation is almost entirely focused on the design landscape. That's their focus. They have almost 2,000 sites under that, 50 under vernacular and 6 under ethnographic. What I find curious about this is, in fact, I think the associative and the ethnographic are the ones that bring us to the idea of the artist and the poet. And the other two come out of the geography tradition. So here are design landscapes, both romantic and classic, an evolved landscape, rice terraces, an associative landscape, Mount M.A., where in fact the clouds represent water, the ocean around this very first Buddhist site in China. So again, this question, is cultural heritage art or geography? Or another way of saying it, are we interested in how we experience the world, or are we, are we observing how the world sort of experiences us? And I think that's a really critical question. I think there's a, often a confusion of a historic landscape with a cultural landscape. A historic landscape is like a historic building, it's like a historic garden, it can be documented, observed, whatever. But a cultural landscape, has another dimension. It's how it's experienced in the cultural imagination. And therefore, in some ways, the cultural landscape is intangible, the historic landscape is intangible. And one of the examples I use is Olmsted, the greatest landscape architect of the 19th century. This is Central Park. This is both a historic landscape and a cultural landscape. It absolutely exists in the public imagination or the cultural imagination. This is another Olmsted Park in Buffalo, which I would argue is a historic landscape representing the work of the great master. But it's not a cultural landscape. Nobody in Buffalo knows it exists because it's been overlaid with parking lots and the university messed up part of it. Nobody will map you that because it no longer is part of the cultural imagination. Here's an even more dramatic example. This is the Mohawk Institute in Brantford. A cultural landscape. Is that a cultural landscape? Well, as a historic landscape, it's got that beautiful, it's got a quarter kilometer tree line drive on axis leading up to this entrance. That beautiful circular drive the kind of treatment of the grass, the shrubs, the whole landscape setting. You could call that a historic landscape. How does it exist in the cultural imagination? Well, in the imperial imagination, this is a cultural landscape which represents civilization, order, control. Here's another image of that school by a survivor. This is a place of cultural genocide. And that is an absolutely fundamental cultural landscape that exists in that place. That place has two cultural landscapes that exist on top of each other, that contradict each other, 
And they're about different understandings of how we understand the world around us. They're not so much about understanding how that place reflects us. This is a part of downtown Cairo where they propose to empty 10 square blocks of every resident, uh, merchant, shop owner, business person, and turn it into a tourist zone because it's a very historic part of Cairo. That's understanding the observed cultural landscape, in this case the historic city, but not the experienced cultural landscape because the place fundamentally changes even if visually it doesn't. This is a cathedral. I regard the interior of cathedrals, mosques, temples as absolutely critical examples of cultural landscape because they help people understand that a cultural landscape at its best is where artifact and ritual coexist in a positive way. And in a cathedral like this, you don't understand it unless you understand or participate in those rituals and the organ is playing and the choir is singing and the place is filled with a kind of ritual that gives meaning to that place. And then at even a larger level, Canada is a diverse country, so you could observe that. There are all sorts of statistics. It's when you get a minister of defense who comes from the Sikh community in India, which is the traditional warrior community, or you have a justice minister who is an Aboriginal woman lawyer, that you actually begin to experience what it means to be a diverse country rather than just talking about it. And I would say that the American election is about two cultural landscapes that coexist in the same observable landscape that J.B. Jackson and Carl Sauer were looking at. So my answer is that we have to use landscape to integrate art and geography, to integrate experience and observation. And in order to get an ecological way forward, we have to respect the fact that it's as important to understand how we understand nature as, or our environment as how our under, environment understands us. I just want to close with a few comments about the Toronto situation. Ontario has this curious thing, cultural heritage landscapes. Defined geographical area, that's the geographer speaking, modified by human activity. Features such as structured spaces, these are all observable. This is the language of the cultural Geographer, how do these places reflect who we've been, who we are? And these are some of the things that they can include. What I find fascinating is that it's identified in the provincial policy statement, not in the Planning Act or the Heritage Act. The policy statement is, is given a place under Part 3 of the Planning Act. So under the Planning Act, you deal with neighborhoods, main streets, villages, all these things that they say are, can be part of cultural heritage landscapes. Under the Heritage Act, you deal with heritage conservation districts and attaching the heritage significance label to it, those various things. But if I were a community in Toronto, I think if I were a community like Kensington Market, which is about as much the intangible, the rituals as well as the artifacts, I would designate as a community ourselves as a cultural heritage landscape above the Planning Act and the Heritage Act. I would in no way put myself under the Planning Act or under the Heritage Act because both of them are dealing with simply the physical evidence of what we have. And it, nowhere in Ontario does it say how you designate a cultural heritage landscape. I think it's absolutely a mistake to try to drag it under the Heritage Act. I think you can try to do it under the Planning Act. The thing about cultural landscapes is that they're beautiful because they resist classification, they resist hierarchy, they resist the expert. The expert cannot observe the cultural landscape, which is very frustrating for many experts. You have to experience the cultural landscape to understand it. And that humility to actually have to go to the community and say, you're going to have to describe the cultural landscape to us because we don't experience it, is very daunting for many people. Uh, and what's interesting is, if as a community you say, we are a cultural heritage landscape, we've decided that we're working under the provincial policy statement, then you can use this part of the Planning Act and say every decision, whether including the Ontario Municipal Board, that affects a planning matter, shall be consistent with the policy statement. And the policy statement says in Ontario, cultural heritage landscapes will be protected. But if you want to push the issue a bit further, I would look to what, this is Pima Choanaki, which has been nominated this huge area in Western Ontario, Eastern Manitoba, for designation by UNESCO. But also if you look at the two recent national historic parks in the Northwest Territories, all of them have chosen the cultural landscape designation, but rather than using any of the most categories, they've used the IUCN category. And IUCN is involved with nature. 
And what's different about this is it says, ice is in uh, protected areas where the interaction of people and nature over time has produced an area of distinct character. Safeguarding the integrity of this interaction. This is the only place you will never find this in Ecomos where people are part of the equation. Because the only thing you'll find in the standards and guidelines for the Conservation of Historic Places in Canada, any of the documents about cultural landscapes, it will be about the evidence of traditional practice, but it won't be about traditional practice. It will be about the evidence of human civilization. This is about using the landscape to reflect our accomplishments. Rather than having the humility to say, what is our relationship to the environment? And if we're going to create a sustainable future, we better go back to a little bit of humility and say, how do we understand our environment? So I'll close with this. This is a drawing of Kensington Market by somebody who spent a lot of time there. And this is as accurate a map of it as any Google map. You've got the globe on Spadina, the stores, the flags, Bellevue Park off to the left in the middle, the music which some of it is within the boundaries, some of it slips over the edges a little bit to some of the performance areas. We have to honor the fact that cultural heritage landscapes are understood from inside, not from outside. Thank you.